roll right into Rose Goldberg's presentation. Rose teaches in the Public Law Institute trainings about veterans benefits, appeals, and military discharge upgrade. Just to tell you a little bit about her, she is a former Skadden Fellow. She is now at Swords to Plowshares. She specializes in helping former service members with other than honorable discharges restore their veteran status. She's going to talk to you about another avenue, one that I introduced to you yesterday, and that is going to the Department of Veterans Affairs and asking for their help in obtaining benefits and services even though there is a less than fully honorable discharge. Just a couple of other connections and then I'll turn it over to Rose. She, um, her background includes several years of health policy at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Wanted to mention that because I know we have someone from DPHHS in the room. She also worked for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee and at the White House on Native American Affairs. So we are very glad to welcome Rose here and I'll turn it over to her. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you, everyone. Those are some tough acts to follow. I also stand between you and lunch, but fortunately, we have a very exciting topic. So we will have a fun pre-lunch hour, and I'm going to jump right in because we have a lot to cover. So bef before going through the agenda, I'd love to see a show of hands for who has heard of a VA character of discharge. OK, that's a lot of you. And how many have actually worked on a VA character of discharge case? OK, a smaller number of hands. So you're the perfect audience. We're going to go through the basics. And I'm really excited about adding another um, tool to your kit to be able to help former service members with other than honorable discharges. And just to make clear, we are moving to an entirely different land. We've been in Department of Defense land for the whole morning. We are moving back into VA territory. So to start, I'm going to talk about what is a character of discharge, otherwise known as a COD. So I will call them CODs throughout the presentation. In the past, they have also been known as character of service. So maybe you've heard character of service or COS. I will talk through a few points of distinction between VA character of discharge and Department of Defense discharge upgrades. They are both very important remedies with some differences that are good to know about. I will talk through the COD application process really step by step. What do you want to file? What are the regulations and statutes you should be looking at? Um, talk about what I think is probably one of the most important parts of the COD process, which is the hearing. We'll talk about some common VA errors. There are a number of them. And then conclude with next steps after a character of discharge decision. So I wanted to briefly uh, give some context to my character of discharge work. I'm a supervising attorney at Swords of Plowshares, a veteran service organization in San Francisco, California, founded in 1974. It's a, it's a large organization that provides wraparound services to veterans. So for example, we now have seven housing sites and we ha house a, just over 400 formerly homeless veterans. So it's a, a really great organization. We have the legal unit, we have policy, we have housing so that veterans can get comprehensive services. And just a little more detail, Hillary mentioned I was a Skadden Fellow, so I started at Source of Plowshares as a Skadden Fellow and built a medical legal partnership with a vet center, the vet center in Oakland. And vet centers are great. I don't know if any of you are familiar with vet centers. They are part of the VA. They provide therapy. And they are the only part of the VA healthcare system that does not use discharge status as an eligibility criteria. So if you have an other than honorable, bad conduct discharge, you can go to a vet center to get therapy. And there are about 300 vet centers across the country. So they're a really ideal place to locate veterans with other than honorable discharges who need assistance. Also a great place to connect with clinicians who can provide medical opinions helpful for discharge upgrades and or character of discharge determinations. So what is a COD? A COD is defined in statute. I have it listed up here. 
And the term of art from this statute is a finding that the veteran was other than dishonorable. It's a pretty, it's a weird term. Um, the term dishonorable here is not used in the same sense as a dishonorable discharge on your DD-214. Um, but this is the kind of finding you are looking for from the VA. What you, your goal is, you want to get a decision from the VA finding your client honorable for VA purposes. So that, that is the end goal. And importantly, when is a COD required? And there are some differences here from the Department of Defense discharge upgrade side. We have a, a graphic up here showing that if the veteran has an honorable discharge, a general discharge, or an uncharacterized discharge status, they do not need to go through the COD process. In fact, the VA will not let them go through the COD process. And that's because you already have access to what the VA views as all of the basic VA benefits. I will add the caveat that there are a few exceptions for uncharacterized discharges. So if you're working with a veteran with an uncharacterized, you'll wanna look closely at the reasons for that. You'll also wanna look closely at a regulation I'm gonna be discussing in a moment. So for character of discharge, we're really talking about veterans with an other than honorable discharge, a bad conduct discharge, or a dishonorable discharge. So one difference with discharge upgrades is if somebody has a general discharge, you would apply before a Department of Defense board for an upgrade, but COD is not a remedy for veterans with a general. I do wanna highlight distinctions between VA character of discharges and Department of Defense discharge upgrades. First, you can do both and absolutely you should do both. You can do them at the same time. You can strategize. I tend to do VA character of discharges first. They tend to be faster. And if you win, you can submit them to the Department of Defense boards and they are persuasive, but the boards do take a long time. So you could file before a board and then supplement with a character of discharge win, but these are really complementary. You don't have to pick one or the other. And just to emphasize the difference in venue, character of discharges, you're going before the VA. Discharge upgrades, you're before the Department of Defense. And importantly, this is the source of a lot of confusion. On the VA side with character of discharges, if you win, the veteran's military records will not be changed. And that is because essentially the military department of defense, they own those records. So if a, a veteran wins the character of discharge, they're found honorable for VA purposes, they get a separate decision letter that says you are honorable for VA purposes. And because of that decision, they can get access to disability benefits, they can walk that letter into the VA hospital, but it's not gonna change their DD-214. So they are, different remedies in that sense, and you really want to talk with your client, the veteran, about their goals. So some other differences looking at the, the benefit side of things, both character of discharges and discharge upgrades restore eligibility for a range of VA benefits, so healthcare, disability compensation, pension, housing programs, the big difference is a VA character of discharge termination does not restore access to the GI Bill. And that is because the VA views the GI Bill as uh, an award, sort of a plus benefit, not a basic benefit. So again, another point where you do really want to talk to the veteran about their goal. I tend to work with older veterans. San Francisco has an older veteran population. I work with a lot of Vietnam era veterans. They're, they've aged out of GI Bill, so that's not a concern, but definitely something to talk to your client about. Another point is that VA character of discharge terminations are persuasive before the board. So if you win a character of discharge, by all means, submit that to the Department of Defense. Um, they will give that weight. And on the flip side, Department of Defense discharge upgrades are binding on VA. So if you file both or if you file discharge upgrade first and you win, you can, you can stop there. You don't even need to go through the VA process. Another important distinction is that I have found that hearings are far more accessible on the VA side. They are a matter of right across the board. You can request a hearing. You don't have to show cause. On the discharge upgrade side, 
We heard from Alan earlier, I think he said he could count the number of hearings in, I think he said 25 years on two hands, not so on the VA side. And those are very powerful uh, venue to present your client's case. Um, it really shows their credibility. It humanizes them. It shows they're not a number. And it also gives a valuable opportunity for back and forth you know, to get a sense of any roadblocks the VA is seeing and be able to rebut those. So that's another advantage to CODs, in my opinion. I have also found that CODs tend to be faster. We heard some very scary wait times for discharge upgrades. CODs can take longer. Um, especially without an advocate. I've seen some that have just sat there for two years with nobody pushing for them. But what I have found is that there are more levers you can push at your local VA regional office. And I definitely encourage you to make friends at your regional office and to really stay on top of a case, make sure it's being worked on. So now that we know generally what a VA character of discharge is, we're going to look at the regulations and statutes that you will be building your case on and that you have to contend with. So you'll become very friendly and familiar with this regulation, 38 CFR 3.12. You will have dreams about this regulation. And an important thing to note at the outset is there are two types of bars to veteran status contained within this regulation. There are statutory bars and regulatory bars, and they're so named because the statutory bars are established in statute, the regulatory bars are established in regulation, and one distinction between these two types of bars is that if a veteran is subject to a regulatory bar, they can still access VA healthcare under limited circumstances. So if they lose their character of discharge, the VA is supposed to automatically process service connection. And if they find the veteran has service-connected conditions, they cannot get disability compensation because they haven't been found honorable, but they can get VA health care for those conditions. Not so with these statutory bars. Statutory bars, you are just you're really locked out of the VA. You lose your COD, you can't get health care, you can't get uh, benefits. So I'm gonna walk through the regulatory bars first and then the statutory bars. The regulatory bars tend to come up more frequently. Um, we have here a list of them starting with by far the most common, willful and persistent misconduct, moral turpitude, discharge, only of general court martial, mutiny or spying, homosexual conduct and aggravated circumstances. So we will walk through all of these. And when a veteran comes to you for help, you're really going to want to look at their case through this mindset, what bars are potentially at issue and what arguments can I raise to push back? So starting with the most common regulatory bar, willful and persistent misconduct, um, because really every word in this regulation matters. I've included the full quote here. And we have two important clauses. The first one explains that engaging in willful and persistent misconduct um, is a bar to veteran status. And secondly, a discharge because of a minor offense will not be considered willful and persistent misconduct if the service was otherwise honest, faithful, and meritorious. So I'll go through each of these clauses one by one. And an important thing to recognize at the outset is this, this and here. Uh, the conduct has to have been both willful and persistent to be a bar to veteran status. So if the misconduct was either not willful or not persi persistent, then this bar should not be at issue. So first looking at willfulness, it, it is kind of a fuzzy term. There is additional definition in another regulation explaining that deliberate or intentional wrongdoing with knowledge of or wanton or reckless disregard of the consequences is willful misconduct. I have had a lot of success in these types of cases where willful and persistent misconduct is at issue, raising mental health as a defense to willfulness. 
in the sense that if the action, the misconduct was a result of a mental health condition, it's really an involuntary trauma response. It's not something deliberate or intentional. Maybe it was an, an avoidance symptom, um, you know, self-medication. So that's an argument you can raise there. Another regulation uh, provides additional clarification for how drug use comes into play in terms of willfulness. Um, drug use is not willful if it was isolated and infrequent, so a lot of advocacy around there, or if it was secondary to an in-service disability, so this would go to self-medication, you know, for PTSD possibly due to combat or military mm -hmm. sexual trauma. Moving on to the second part of this bar, we have persistent. This is not well-defined. There's not a specific number of instances of misconduct that would qualify as persistent, and I would encourage you um, to really push through on cases, even if it seems like it's a, a lot of numbers of misconduct. I have one cases, uh, a service member had 15 um, NJPs, non-judicial punishments. The circumstances really matter. It's not just a counting game, but it is something the VA is going to be looking at. They are gonna be counting the number of instances of misconduct. We really want to explain what was going on, put that in perspective. We have a uh, definition here, multiple offenses are not necessarily persistent, so you shouldn't say, oh, there are two, there are three, this is a no-go, there's no merit. Um, also, it's not persistent if it's spread out in time, so it looks very different if the veteran served for 10 years and had three instances of misconduct versus somebody who served for six months and had three instances of misconduct, so look closely at that. Um, duration of prior service is also important, so maybe they had 20 years of um, laudable service and they had some mistakes at the end, they will consider that as well. AWOLs are a, a common type of misconduct that comes up in these types of cases and there's no set benchmark for how long of an AWOL or how many of an AWOLs is persistent. There is some case law with different percentages, so it's helpful to break down the percent for the VA one case said that, for example, an AWOL that was 18% of service was persistent, so you'll want to look at that. So moving back to the second part of this regulatory bar, remember if the misconduct was minor and the service was otherwise honest, faithful, and meritorious, you can get over this bar. So what does minor mean? Um, Conduct is not considered minor if it precludes performance of duties, but on the other hand, technically, non-judicial punishments are minor. Uh, I've had trouble getting the VA to recognize that, but that is, it technically is the case, so something to push them to recognize in terms of AWOLs, an AWOL of over 30 days is technically not minor, and in terms of the otherwise honest, faithful, and meritorious, this is really where you want to essentially, uh, you know, brag on behalf of your client, highlight any awards, deployments, um, you know, high performance, all that kind of stuff. So moving on to the second regulatory bar, do we have any immigration law practitioners here? No? Well, I was going to say this moral turpitude might look very familiar to you. It comes up in other legal contexts, but as is often the case, is somewhat different in the, the veterans context. So this is our second regulatory bar that states that an offense involving moral turpitude is a bar to veteran status and it generally includes a conviction of a felony. So we're gonna break this down a little bit. An important resource to be aware of is the VA Office of General Counsel has issued precedential opinions that really breaks down a lot of these character of discharge bars, so they're a really important resource. We have these very sparse regulations, but look to these general counsel opinions for more guidance. So for moral turpitude, it explains that moral turpitude is a willful act, gravely violates moral standards, expected to cause harm. It also makes the important point that a felony only creates a rebuttable presumption of moral turpitude. So if you have somebody with a, a felony issue, you can push back on that. You can break arguments to say that that is not moral turpitude. 
and also provisions saying that the VA must consider mitigating circumstances. So an example of something that might fall under, potentially fall under moral turpitude would be a sort of you know, theft, robbery, uh, an act of violence, so that's the kind of stuff you wanna look out for. I'll quickly go through the less common regulatory bars. Uh, one is en lieu of a discharge, <coughs> only of a general court martial. And the important thing to note here is for this bar to apply, it has to be a general court martial, not a special court martial. Uh, general court martial is basically the equivalent of a, a felony in the military system. Special is more approximate to a misdemeanor, less serious, and you often will want to look closely through the veteran's military records. Their one page G214, often it will just say court martial, but it won't specify the type. So for this bar to apply, it has to have been a general, so look through their records to clarify that. Another bar to veteran status is mutiny or spying. I have never seen this come up. Maybe it does. Hopefully it doesn't. Um, <laughs> The last one is homosexual conduct with aggravated circumstances. I have never had this one come up. It has come up in my office before. Um, this one raises some pretty serious constitutional concerns, and Dana will be talking later today about a petition to change some of these rules, particularly this one. So we have blazed through the regulatory bars. Now we're gonna turn to the statutory bars. These come up somewhat less frequently. I find they are harder to overcome. They tend to be a little bit more concrete, sometimes less room for advocacy, but still room for advocacy. So the first one is discharge by general court martial. So again, this has to have been a general court martial, not a special court martial, so make sure to clarify that. The next one is an AWOL of at least 180 continuous days. So note, it has to have been continuous. Uh, the veteran may have had 1,000 days of AWOL, but if no, none of those chunks were continuous 180 days, this bar would not apply. There is a lot of room for advocacy under this statutory bar. Um, the regulation specifically provides that the VA will consider compelling circumstances for the AWOL, and they view compelling circumstances very broadly. They look at quality of service, uh, if they, the veteran was attending to some serious family matters, health issues, so really explore that with your, your client to see why they went AWOL and present that thoroughly. Even though the regulation only provides for compelling circumstances for these prolonged AWOLs. I've had success preventing the, presenting the same types of arguments for shorter AWOLs. So always make sure to do some fact finding about what was going on, why they went AWOL. Additional statutory bars, we have desertion. An important point here is that desertion is a technical term that I find can be used somewhat loosely in military records. Um, I have found that it was an AWOL or a short unauthorized absence and the, the word desertion will be kind of littered throughout the military records, but for it to actually be a statutory bar, it has to be desertion under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, Article 85, so don't just do control fine for desertion, really look at what the, what the charge was to see if this bar is really an issue. Another one is conscientious objector who refuse to follow lawful orders. And the thing to note here is you can be a conscientious objector who followed orders, and this, this bar would not apply. So this can require some fact-finding, digging into the records to see if they were refusing to follow orders. So really look carefully at that. Um, the next one is another one I have never seen come up. Alien during a period of hostilities when service member requested release. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this come up, but it's there. So just good to know it's there. Um, we also have, as a statutory bar, resignation of an officer for the good of the service. This one does come up on occasion. So we've talked through the regulatory bars and the statutory bars. So let's say hypothetically you've met a veteran, you've looked through their records, uh, you're familiar with what their misconduct was. 
Um, let's say you're seeing a lot of these bars come up as potentially an issue. Don't despair. There is a very broad exception to all regulatory and statutory bars, and this is called the insanity exception. And this is laid out in our friendly regulation, this 38 CFR 3.12 that explains that if the service member was insane at the time they committed the misconduct, they will not be barred from benefits. So you really want to look closely at this, even if you think you have arguments to push back on the bars on their own, you do wanna see if insanity is at play. So insanity is defined in a, a different regulation. I provided the citation here. It is, in my opinion, not the best crafted Regulation, it has been um, subject to some criticism. One veteran law judge, in an opinion, called it gibberish. Um, I've had varied responses from medical experts when I've tried to get medical opinions. Some say this is inconsistent with medical standards. I have nothing to say about this. Others say, yes, this would apply to everyone. <laughs> um, so it, it can be tricky, um, but some people use it very successfully, so I would look very closely at it and um, sort of bullet pointed here the main points in the insanity exception. So the first thing to note is insanity um, comes from a disease. That's the term they use, a disease. And there are three different circumstances, three independent types of insanity. So the first would be a prolonged deviation from normal method of behavior. The second is interferes with a piece of society. And the third, lacks the adaptability to make future adju further adjustment to the social customs of the community in which he resides. So I'll leave it to you to decide if you think this is something that makes sense or not, but important to try to, to grapple with it, to advocate. And again, there is a helpful um, VA Office of General Counsel presidential opinion that breaks down the regulatory definition we just looked at it explains a few things. So this qualifying disease, for a disease to qualify for purposes of insanity, it cannot be due to a personality disorder. So that's something to note at the outset. The next is that um, the deviation or the abnormal behavior cannot be attributable purely to a substance abuse disorder. Um, and the deviation they're looking for generally is very severe deviation. So there are some comments in the general counsel opinion saying, you know, AWOLs, it's not that uncommon. You can't just say you're insane and you deviated because you, you went on a, a short AWOL. Uh, there also is a note in the general counsel opinion that insanity is essentially synonymous with psychosis. Uh, but on the other hand, there are some VA decisions saying that PTSD can qualify as insanity. So this, in my mind, is an unsettled area of the law. It's being pulled in two different directions. So I would really advocate strongly, no matter what the level um, you're seeing in terms of mental health, I would push to apply this exception either way. And I have observed some differences also between regional offices in terms of how they're viewing and applying insanity. So it can be a learning experience, you know, do a few of these cases and kind of get a sense of how your regional office is viewing and applying insanity and try to push back on that if necessary. Another note is uh, there need not be causation between the insanity and the misconduct. They only have to be contemporaneous. So you don't need to find a link between, you know, the, the psychosis made the service member do X, Y, and Z. You can just have evidence showing, you know, say the service member was psychotic and this happened while they were psychotic. So that lessens the burden a little bit in terms of the medical evidence, the medical opinion you can submit for insanity. So having gone through all the bars, I wanted to highlight a very important resource. We've been mostly looking at regulations. I mentioned a few statutes. And this is a sub-regulatory resource, um, VA guidance. It's known as the VA manual. And it's available online. And the VA uses this um, 
for their character of discharge procedure. So you can look through step by step. It's outlined how the VA is going to process a character of discharge application. It also contains information on how they're interpreting these regulations we just walked through. So you will definitely want to look through the VA manual. Uh, it's not specific to character of discharges. It has everything. So it also has information about how they the VA processes disability claims, which is generally a very good thing to look at when advocating for veterans on the VA side. Especially important at the, I find, at the initial levels of review. So say you're not working on an appeal, um, you are often having adjudicators who are not attorneys. They may be working purely from the manual, not from the statutes or regulations. So you really want to speak their language. I would be remiss if I didn't give a little bit of a warning um, the VA manual is prone to have some errors, and I've found a few <laughs> in my time. So really read it with a grain of salt. Always have an eye to the underlying regulations or statutes. Uh, just give a few examples of some mistakes that the manual formally contained. Um, so benefit of the doubt does apply to character of discharge applications, um, but until 2016, the manual erroneously did not recognize that. It held um, applicants who are applying for character of discharge determination to a higher standard than veterans who are applying for disability benefits. Um, for those who don't know, benefit of the doubt is the evidentiary standard for VA claims, so that was incorrect for a while. Uh, another character of discharge related mistake is there was a statement in the manual saying that if a veteran with a bad conduct discharge got a positive character of discharge determination, they still would not be able to access VA health care. It made absolutely no sense. There was no basis in statute or regulation, and it was fortunately promptly removed. So just be keep an eye out. If you see something in there that doesn't make sense, um, you might want to call the general counsel's office. <laughs> So now in terms of the actual process, we know the regulations and the laws. How do you actually apply for a character of discharge? It's a little bit wacky in my opinion. Um, and that is because there is no specific character of discharge form. The VA has decided um, that it's more efficient to have a veteran apply for a disability benefit and to have that disability benefit application trigger character of discharge review because if a veteran is applying for character of discharge review, their ultimate goal is disability benefits. So you file that uh, VA disability claim and that will trigger the character of discharge review. And it's important to note character of discharge review is not automatic. I have encountered some um, veterans who think, you know, they, they leave service and the VA is just automatically going to do this review. You have to actually apply for a benefit and there's no um, statute of limitation whatsoever for character of discharge review. So you will want to apply for a benefit and there are two main ways to get this process started. One is to apply for a benefit through the um, Veterans Benefits Administration. So just file the application. Um, that's the first way, that's the way that I tend to do it. Um, another way is you can actually apply through the, the healthcare side. So a, a veteran can go to a VA hospital, uh, they will be rejected for care, they will often be told they're not a veteran because they have bad paper. Um, what is supposed to happen there, and doesn't always happen, but what's supposed to happen is um, they are supposed to initiate character of discharge review at the VA hospital, they're supposed to send an application to the benefits side. I don't do this way because it doesn't seem to happen terribly consistently. Uh, it's just an extra step from paper to move from the healthcare side to the benefits side, but it is an option. And you may encounter veterans who have actually received character of discharge reviews and denials without knowing it even happened. They went to a hospital and they were turned away and unbeknownst to them, this form was submitted to the benefits side and they were denied and maybe they'd moved, they didn't get the denial letter. So just be aware um, that veterans may have actually been denied before without their knowledge. And if that's the case, you will want to um, submit new and material, I guess now it's called new and relevant 
evidence to be able to reopen that. It's usually not very difficult because if they weren't represented, they weren't advocating for themselves, nothing really was filed except for paperwork, but just something to be aware of. So breaking it down a little bit, the elements of an application, so the benefits form is really just what you're doing to trigger this review, but of course you're gonna wanna submit uh, you know, advocacy to actually increase the chances of success for your client. So you will have just the, the benefits form. Um, I always request a hearing right at the outset with that benefits form. And like I said, you don't need any particular cause or showing to get a hearing. You can just write one sentence, I request a hearing on my character of discharge and they thereby have a right to a hearing. Um, and the, the packet, the character of discharge packet is very similar to what you would file for a discharge upgrade, uh, just with the main difference being that your arguments are gonna be different. There are different rules. As you can see, these regulations are pretty fine grained. There's you know 180 day mark for AWOL, that kind of stuff on the discharge upgrade side. There's these looser terms like clemency, liberal consideration. So your brief will look different, but the other elements are similar. Definitely want a statement from the veteran, supporting statements from friends, uh, fellow service members, anybody that can really shed light on what the circumstances of discharge were. Medical opinions are extremely valuable, um, probably almost necessary for insanity and to rebut willfulness. So if you can get one of those, they're pretty golden. And uh, the VA does obtain service records, but I was like making sure they have the important service records and incorporating those into my brief so they have the important portions highlighted. And stepping back a little bit before doing your brief, and this applies for discharge upgrades too, I think doing a chronology is essential. Um, what you're really trying to tell the VA is what happened and why it happened. So they want to know if a uh, trauma occurred, was the misconduct before or after, um, if there was a trauma outside of the service, they really want to know the timeline, you know, what led to X, Y, or Z. So this is a really important tool to build your theory of the case. I also find it helpful to give to um, clinicians who are gonna write a medical opinion. I always give them the service record so they can ground their opinion in the, the service records, but also a timeline to, to give them a sense of, of what happened when they're jumping into those service records. So going back to character discharge hearings because they're so important, like I mentioned, I request this at the outset. Um, you are actually required to request them within 60 days of what is known as a character of discharge development letter. So when you file your initial character of discharge application, not too long after, the veteran will get what's called development letter. Development really means the VA is trying to develop evidence and it just says, you know, please submit any evidence and support your character of discharge. So you should restate your desire for your hearing within 60 days. Again, it can be one sentence even. Um, another important thing to note in terms of character of discharges potentially being faster than discharge upgrades, there are some expedite categories that can get you into a hearing faster and get you a decision faster. So if the veteran is homeless um, because of age, extreme financial hardship, you should make that very clear and request that the hearing be scheduled as soon as possible. And I've, I have found um, that that can really uh, make it quite a bit faster. So what are these VA hearings? Um, sometimes they are in person at the VA regional office. Sometimes they will be uh, a video hearing. I prefer in person. I think it just, the more personal you can make the hearing experience, um, the more you can have the adjudicator get to know the veteran, the client, the better. There is no set time limit. Mine have ranged uh, somewhere between 20 minutes to two hours. I have found that the VA is accustomed to them being short, partially because so many veterans are unrepresented, so they sometimes seem a little impatient, maybe a little surprised that you know I'm going on for two hours, but you should take all the time you need, the veterans should take all the time they need to tell their story. Um, there's usually two VA adjudicators, sometime more, and it, it is informal. 
you're sitting at a, a conference table, and I always emphasize that to clients to make it less intimidating. And I have found it, it can be possible to speak informally off the record with the VA hearing officer before or after the hearing, which I, I found helpful. And another note, do not assume that the VA adjudicator has read your filings before the hearing for a few reasons. One is just because of workload. They're not always looking through everything beforehand, so don't assume any previous knowledge. And um, for those of you who work on the VA benefits side, it, there can be big lag between filing and it showing up in the internal VA system, so make sure to walk through everything you want them to know. And the hearing officers are not character of discharge specialists. And character of discharges are a small portion of what the VA does. The majority of veterans have honorable discharges. So really take your time to walk through all the regulations. Again, don't assume any knowledge. And a little warning, according to the VA manual, the VA hearing officer is technically required to make the decision on the character of discharge, which makes a lot of sense. They've met with the veteran, they've assessed their credibility, that's you know what a, a trial is for, but I have found because of workflow issues, sometimes they're trying to shift the decision to other people in the VA, so I would really fight back on that. It's really important to have the person who met the veteran, you know, saw their live testimony make the decision. In terms of the format of the hearing, it will open by the VA hearing officer reading a script, they will swear in the veteran, um, and then they will really open up the floor to you to conduct the hearing as you like. So you can start with an opening statement, um, you have the, the veteran testify, and the rules of evidence do not apply. You can ask leading questions, which can be very helpful, so I would take advantage of that. And the hearing is audio recorded, and they submit it to have it transcribed, which can take a varying amount of time, and they usually wait to make the decision until after the transcription comes back through. And you're also allowed to take as many breaks as you want during the hearing to confer with your client. So in terms of testimony, what should you present at the hearing aside from legal arguments, you know, walking through these either regulatory and or statutory bars that are at our issue? Um, the veteran is required to attend the hearing. The VA manual makes clear that hearings are not solely for the purpose of argument. They really view it as for the purposes of evidence gathering. So if you cannot show up alone as the attorney, I have um, heard of a few occasions where there was some mix up and the veteran could not get to the hearing and they were able to call in and it did proceed. So that is an option though I think usually in person is preferable. Uh, and the hearing officer will almost always ask the veteran if they have anything they would like to say. The veteran is not required to say anything. I think probably in most cases it's helpful for the veteran to say something to explain the circumstances of their service, what happened, what was going on with the misconduct in rare circumstances that might not be that beneficial. Um, you know, I've had some clients with some severe memory issues, have no idea what happened in service, and that wouldn't be a value. But usually the VA wants to hear from the veteran. They want to hear their story. In terms of other witnesses, um, you can bring whomever you like. Um, friends and family members probably aren't going to be actually helpful as witnesses because the character of discharge process is very focused on what happened during service, not any positives after service, but they can attend for moral support. If you can find a buddy, a fellow service member to come testify, that can be very valuable because they can actually speak to what was happening during service. I've never had this happen again. Maybe it's because I tend to work with older veterans who are further out from service. Um, and I had a, a snafu where uh, a medical expert who's coming to testify her doggy care um, got canceled, and her dog, her therapy dog came to the hearing, so apparently uh, dogs are allowed at hearings they're, if they're quiet. So we will hear more about this later today. Medical experts are really invaluable for character of discharge. I can't emphasize this enough. They can attend hearings. They can submit written medical opinions. Um, with my medical legal partnership at the Oakland 
vet center. It's a pretty strong relationship. Uh, a clinician has come to basically all of my hearings, and you can question the medical expert as you would any other witness, and I would really urge you to really thoroughly prepare your medical expert. I have found that as you know, a therapist, they may tend to be more focused on current circumstances and less so on what happened in service. They might be prepared to come in to talk about how the um, post-traumatic stress is affecting the veteran in their current life, and that is not what is at issue in the character of discharge. What they really need to hear in the character of discharge is how the post-traumatic stress led to the misconduct. So you really want to um, get the clinician to focus a little bit backwards, which is not necessarily natural for them. Also, we have these wacky terms like willfulness, insanity, that are not common medical standards. So you'll want to get your clinician up to speed on those and able to speak through those terms. So I mentioned there are some common uh, VA errors in character of discharge. Oh, excuse me, not at errors yet, common VA questions. Um, I have found that there are some repeat questions I tend to get at hearings. Some of them are not that germane to the character of discharge itself, but just wanted to make these available as a heads up, things that you might, you or the client might uh, be asked by the adjudicator, so that's there for you. I have found that the adjudicators overall, not across the board, are somewhat hesitant to ask too many questions. And I think this is due in part because there is, uh, by rule, they are not allowed to cross-examine the veteran. So I think there's some hesitancy to <coughs> ask too many questions and delve into that territory. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword in a sense, so I think it's good if they ask questions. You want to know what's on the VA's mind. You want to know what roadblocks they're seeing, but the overall tendency is they view their role as being there to simply absorb the evidence. So if I'm not getting many questions, I try to push them to ask some questions. So I might say, you know, do you see any barriers to this character of discharge going through? Because I want to know if they are seeing any hurdles so I can push back on them and provide relevant counter arguments. And again, get the hearing officer's contact information. You really want to hold the character of discharge case's hand all the way through, because um, you know, like I mentioned, sometimes you know, the case will get shifted to somebody else who didn't do the hearing. Um, they can sit for a while after the transcript comes in. So you want somebody you can check in with. So what to do after the hearing, you wait for the transcript. This can take a few months. The veteran does have the right to waive the transcript. So <clears throat> if the hearing went very well and you are positive the veteran will win, you could waive the transcript. Uh, they are technically not allowed to tell you the outcome at the hearing, but there could be a variety of reasons why you'd want to waive the transcript to speed things up sometimes. The VA will want additional evidentiary development. You know, maybe you've gone through service records in detail and it comes to light that some are missing, so they might kind of put um, a hold on the case to make sure they have the complete service records. You can also request permission to submit additional evidence, you know, clarify a timeline with them, which can be helpful if you know, something came up that you can address with additional evidence. And you know, keep in touch with that hearing officer. So now to the common VA COD errors. Um, one thing I wish we had time to go into, but it would take probably another half an hour to an hour, is uh, failure to recognize multiple enlistments. So if a veteran has multiple enlistments, their VA benefits do vest in an honorable enlistment. So if a veteran, say, had two enlistments, the first was honorable, the second was an other than honorable, Sometimes they actually only receive one DD-214 and it will just have the other than honorable. So it can take a little bit of work to get the VA to recognize, no, actually, this veteran served for six years honorably. They can get disability compensation for any conditions that arose during that period. Um, so that's something that comes up. We have seen some, some factual errors, so just look closely at what they're pointing to in the denial. Make sure to confirm that in the service records. I have seen them have um, higher evidentiary burdens for bad conduct discharges. Um, just sort of a sense that you know a bad conduct discharge is just categorically worse than an other than honorable, but 
you know, the, the VA is applying the law and they have to have a basis in law for th their decision. And there's nothing in the regulations or the statutory bars we walked through that says a bad conduct discharge has a higher burden. It's only if it was from a general court martial. Um, also a sense that mental health is not relevant unless it rises to the level of insanity. Um, so really be careful of that and make sure they're paying attention to mitigating mental health that might not rise to the level of insanity. Uh, as I mentioned, benefit for the doubt does apply to character of discharge determinations. I have seen a lot of confusion on this point, so look closely at that. Um, I've also seen some problems in my regional office, a sense that because the applicant is technically not a veteran yet under VA law, they are not entitled to you know, these, these veteran rights. So for example, these expedite flashes I mentioned, if they're homeless, I have gotten pushback where they say this person is not yet a veteran, they cannot avail themselves of these rights, and that's not true any applicant is entitled to these rights. I've also seen the application of a Department of Defense like AIR standard. So earlier this morning, we heard about equity, impropriety, and AIR. And as we saw, there was nothing in these regulations or statute that looks at, at AIRs per se, but I have seen sort of the incorporation of a Department of Defense like mindset into the VA inappropriately. So let's say um, you have one character of discharge for your client. This is really a momentous occasion. It opens up a lot of doors, like I mentioned, VA healthcare, disability benefits, pension, VA housing. Um, because you filed a disability benefits application with the character of discharge, the VA is just supposed to start processing that automatically. So they'll schedule compensation and pension exams um, and get rolling on rating and service connecting those conditions. I've seen a few delays in that happening, so make sure you keep an eye on them actually doing that, that next step. I've had a few issues with veterans with a favorable character of discharge getting VA health care. Um, and I, my sense is because of a lack of training on the VA healthcare side. So if the veteran walks in, they have their um, honorable character of discharge. The eligibility staff at the VA hospital has never seen this before. There's an 85% denial rate. They don't come through the door often. They just say, I don't know what this is. I see another than honorable, you should leave. Um, so that can take some education. You know, talk to managers, make sure that the staff at the hospital knows what this is because they have a right to healthcare at that point. And I've also found that it is easy to convert character of discharge filings into Department of Defense filings. Uh, the regulations are very different, but the same type of evidence applies. So if you have lost your character of discharge, don't despair, keep fighting. There are different types of appeals you can file. This landscape is very different now with the appeals modernization, but you know, keep pushing to get that recognized. And the main takeaways are make friends at your VA regional office. You know, your brief is only so strong as making sure somebody's reading it and following up on it. So I think it's really that two-step, the legal research and advocacy and actually pushing it through the system. Um, I really all, would always request a hearing and don't assume that your adjudicator knows COD laws. Really break it down for them. So I hope you all are as excited as I am now about character of discharges. Now you have two different sets of tools for veterans with bad paper. Thank you.